We are very blessed today. We have Sister Veronica Mary Sullivan. She's been a religious sister with the Sisters of Life, a religious community based in New York for 21 years. The mission of the Sisters of Life is to promote and enhance the dignity of every human life. She is currently the local superior and coordinator of the Hope and Healing Mission, an outreach to women who have suffered after abortion. Prior to entering religious life, Sister Veronica was a registered nurse for a number of years, serving six of those years in the U.S. Air Force. Sister Veronica is a native of Waterbury and is the biological sister of Father Jim Sullivan. Gentlemen, let's welcome Sister Veronica. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Isn't it nice to be together? Someplace. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Well, whenever I speak in Connecticut or Waterbury in particular, people might not remember Sister Veronica, but they'll remember Father Jim Sullivan's sister. <laughs> Everything I know about him these days I read about in the newspaper. <laughs> but uh, I could tell you a few things about Father Jim, but that'll be for another day. <laughs> I'm here to talk about the soon to be blessed Father Michael J. McGivney. But uh, first, thanks to yeah, amen. I want to thank Ken and the board who extended the invitation to invite me to speak with you and be with you all today. Um, I think it's just an amazing privilege and I'm very humbled and honored to be with you. And I'm here with three of my sisters here in the front row. <laughs> Sister Hope, Sister Anima, and Sister Caroline. God is good. Even during the pandemic, we just received eight new postulants a week and a half ago. So thank you, Jesus. But uh, you might wonder, why is Sister Veronica speaking to us about Father McGivney? She's definitely not a Knight of Columbus. And we're here at a men's conference, and, well, she's not a man. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a sister of life. It began when, in 2006, uh, my brother Dennis was at the point of death after a very serious cardiac arrest. And my brothers and I were inspired to pray at the tomb of Father McGivney in New Haven and, for a miracle, which we needed imminently and it was granted. Uh, the doctors had really prepared us that there was no hope, and after praying there, by the time we got back to the hospital, uh, it was uh, a miracle, according to the Muslim doctor who was taking care of him. So that began my intrigue about Father McGivney, wanting to know more. I picked up the book, Parish Priest, which I would highly recommend to anyone who is as curious as I was as to who this person is. After reading it, and I've read it several times, I found this is not only someone that reminds me of myself, born of Irish immigrants in Waterbury, but he grew up about a mile away from where I grew up on the same Naugatuck River. So I was intrigued to kind of follow his footsteps and did an awful lot of research on his life. I'll tell you first, before I begin, a little bit about who we are as sisters of life. Uh, we were founded in 1991 by the late, great John Cardinal O'Connor. And as uh, was said in the beginning, we uphold the dignity of every human person and the sacredness of human life, believing that every person is good and that their life is unique and valuable and unrepeatable. And in our world today, this truth is so easy to forget. 
that we are made not for mediocrity and not by some random choice, but intentionally from the heart of a God who loves us and loves you and made you for greatness. Every person has been chosen by God for a special purpose. Each one of you here is a unique, irreplaceable gift to the world. Each one of us sisters rotates through our postulant house, which is located in the Bronx. And although we're not teachers, we often go next door to the grade school to have lunch with the graders there, first to eighth grade. And one day, a number of sisters were sitting with the kindergartners, which is always an experience. And one sister sat across from a little girl who in, in a typical Bronx, unfiltered fashion, looked at her and said, what is that on your head? And you know, the sister starts talking about brides and weddings and this little girl's getting more and more confused. And finally, sister said, I wear a veil because I'm married to Jesus. And the little girl with her eyes wide, slams her hands on the table, leans forward and says, he chose you. <laughs> I ask myself that question every day. But not only did God chose me as his bride, I believe Father McGivney has chosen me, among others, many others, as a friend, perhaps to help spread the message that his mission on earth is not over, and especially not here in Connecticut. You, all of us here who call Connecticut home, should be so proud that in about six weeks we'll have our own very own saint. I have come to know Father Mike, as I like to call him, very personally over the years. And at today I'd like to do three things. First, I'd like to give you a little history of who the man was. Who is this priest, man, blessed Father McGivney? And number two, where is he at work today? Number three, I'd like to say, where is he at work in Catholic men and through them? A little background. Father McGivney was born in 1852, just over 20 miles from here in Waterbury. He was the oldest of 12, the son of Irish immigrants, Patrick McGivney and Mary Lynch who left County Cavan during the potato famine and came to Connecticut in 1849. And they, like so many, were attracted by the many employment opportunities that were offered along the Naugatuck Valley factories. The family's home was on Railroad Hill Street in the south end of Waterbury. And his father worked as a molder in one of the brass factories first at Merritt Nichols, and then at the Farrell Foundry, all in the south end of Waterbury, and a short walk from the family home. I suspect that there is many people here who will recognize the names of the factories, and maybe your fathers and grandfathers, or maybe you yourself have worked there. Scovels, Chase, American Brass, okay. Our own father started at the Metal Hose when he came from Ireland in 1953, and then worked 30 years at the Platt, at Platt Brothers. As a young boy, uh, Michael was seen and noted to be especially bright. And so he skipped a few grades and actually graduated from East Main Street School, which is now where the Palace Theater is in Waterbury, on East Main Street and graduated at 13 rather than 16. He wanted to become a priest and his father wanted him to wait and didn't uh, encourage it at the time. And so he worked in a factory called Holmes Booth and Hayden's, which made spoons. But he had his eyes on the priesthood from a very early age and he was no doubt encouraged and formed during those years by his own parish priest Father Thomas Hendrickson, a real hero, and then he would enter the seminary when his father gave him permission. 
For a Catholic growing up in the 19th century Connecticut, the church was the center of life, and it was growing explosively. Streams of Catholics from all over Europe and Canada, French Canada, from Mexico, were pouring in looking for jobs. They faced great poverty, uncertainty, and a certain anti-Catholic discrimination, and there was a perpetual shortage of priests. Young Michael, he saw a need, and he was call, felt he was called to do something, and he wanted to step up. He attended seminary, first in Quebec, in the minor seminary, and then in Niagara, and then he had his eyes on the Jesuit seminary in Quebec. Before he finished his first year, his father died suddenly, and in 1873, he went back to Waterbury, wondering whether or not he would have to give up his dream of being a priest and go to work to support his younger siblings. But providentially, his, old, his sisters and their spouses pulled together and said that they would take care of the family, that he should follow his dream. And the bishops, noting his talent, sent him instead to Baltimore to study at St. Mary's Seminary there, and we're so glad that he wasn't lost to the Jesuits and to Connecticut, which he could have. <laughs> Father McGivney was ordained in 1877 and celebrated at his first mass at the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Waterbury. And I'm so proud of my brother who's now the pastor there. So that's so beautiful. His first assignment was at the very prestigious St. Mary's Church on Hill House Avenue in New Haven not far from the Yale campus. But in all that I've read, in all the descriptions of who this man was, he had no airs about him. They say he was mild-mannered. He was light-hearted. He was intelligent, but also compassionate and very practical. He was energetic and determined, a man of action. As one admirer described him, he was a man of extreme grace in manner in any society. I saw him but once, but I remember his face as if I saw it only yesterday. It was the face of a priest, and that explains everything. It was a face of wonderful repose. There was nothing harsh in his countenance, although there was everything that was strong. To meet him was at once to trust him, and children loved him, and the very old people of the neighborhood called him a positive saint and meant it. He also loved baseball all his life, which is why I think he would be quite pleased that I'm standing on the first base line, I think, <laughs> on a platform. Father McGivney was an unassuming parish priest, but he was also a visionary, ahead of his time. His focus, however, was on the individual person in front of him. He saw men tempted to alcohol and immoral living, lost and without mooring, and so he wanted to provide community and wholesome, healthy fun. He saw a need, and he did something about it because he cared. He took them on boat trips, he put on plays, he organized church fairs, anything to bring his flock together. But then, as a 28-year-old associate pastor, God chose him for a very special task. As Father Joseph Daly, a contemporary of his, would say, his special vocation was to develop Catholic manhood to bind into one conspicuous solidarity all the elements that make for strength of character. He saw the potential and need for the laity to take up their proper place in the church, and so began what became the largest Catholic men's fraternal organization in the world, the Knights of Columbus. The Knights have as their core principles unity, charity, 
patriotism, and fraternity, with an emphasis on fraternity, seeing each other as brothers, brother knights, and their neighbor as their brother and sister in need. The very first council, San Salvador, was begun at St. Mary's Church in New Haven in 1882. Father McGivney faced much opposition as he sought to bring something new and unprecedented in the church. At one point he wrote that the order I was endeavoring to establish fell back almost lifeless, but not dead. The first sign of hope came when a second council was formed in Meriden, the Silver City Council. By next spring, there were five councils and 450 members. By 1885, the councils were springing up one every other week in towns right around this area. Middletown was council number three. Councils in Hartford, Wallingford, Cromwell, New Britain, Stratford, Norwalk, Thomaston, and Waterbury, Bridgeport, and in dozens of Connecticut cities, towns, and villages. It was clear that Father McGivney's vision was fulfilling a real need and that God was behind him. Today, there are 200 councils in Connecticut alone, over 23,000 knights here, and in the world, there are over 16,000 councils with almost two million members in more than a dozen countries. All, yes. All this ultimately because of one man who was, had vision, was determined, and who was a man of action who saw a need and responded. May I ask how many knights are here today? Oh, wow. Everybody. <laughs> it's wonderful. And thank you. After he left St. Mary's in 1886, he remained close to the knights as their founder, of course, but stayed away from the growth and the governance of the knights. He left that to the laity. Father McGivney became the pastor of St. Thomas Church in Thomaston, with a second parish soon after in Terryville, some three and a half miles away. He served faithfully in what was his first love, that of being a parish priest, and continued to put on plays and encourage wholesome fun and oversee church fairs and, of course, minister the sacraments to all. But only four years later, worn out by his own relentless pace, he contracted the flu during a pandemic in 1890, which turned into pneumonia and left his health in a permanent weakened state of which he never recovered. And so Father McGivney died in his rectory in Thomaston on August 14, 1890, at the age of only 38. Although Father McGivney poured himself out as a parish priest on earth for just over a dozen years, his work is far from over. He continues to see the needs and do something about them. He continues to see the person in front of him. In my own family, we could write a small book about how many favors and miracles we have seen in our own lives. He has, in a sense, become one of us, and hundreds of favors have been reported because of his intercession. I think you may have read, maybe not, that the beatification miracle was, that was approved uh, was just one of many in 2015, and the, and the miracle is actually uh, this. In 2015, a married couple in Tennessee, Michelle and Daniel Shalecki, were given a devastating diagnosis for their unborn child, fetal hydrops, which is fluid on his internal organs, and it's fatal. The doctors gave them no hope. 
One doctor specialist said, in my 30 years, I've never seen anyone survive. He said, what does it matter? This is your 13th child and he has Down syndrome. Her husband, Daniel, a faithful knight, and his wife did not want to give up on their son. They prayed through the intercession of Father McGivney for a miracle. Michelle said, I went from how will I ever take care of a child with Down syndrome with 12 others to please God, I want a child with Down syndrome. And Father McGivney saw their need, and he did something about it. The fluid disappeared from the unborn child, and little Mikey now runs around at five years old and is the delight of his family. He's working right here among us and very close to home. About a month ago, I was driving, I was visiting my family, and I was actually driving um, through Thomaston on my way to see my brother John and his family. And on the way, I frequently stop here and there at, at the uh, places that meant a lot to Father McGivney. And as I was passing by one of these places, I felt an overwhelming urge to uh, stop and pray and I was tempted to ignore it because I was running late already. And, um, but I did. And I pulled over into this parking lot. There's really no building there anymore. And went over to the place where there was a structure at one point and prayed. Not quite sure why I was there. And uh, there was another car at the distance, but there was no one around. But on my way back to the car, I saw a man emerge from a building, and um, he kind of stopped and stared at me, and I just waved, hello, and we chatted for a little while, and he obviously was surprised to see his sister looking like this, walking around an empty parking lot on a late Sunday afternoon. But uh, needless to say, I went to get one of our own magazines, which is printed by the Knights of Columbus, by the way, and give it to him. And as I returned, ready to hand it to him, he said, Sister, can I talk to you? I said, of course. And he said, he, out came his story of uh, a very troubled life, a very, very difficult time he was going through with with many seemingly unsurpassable problems. And he was at the point of despair. And he said, Sister, I was just sitting inside the building. I have a key, wondering if I could go on anymore. And I had been sitting there for a long time, thinking hard about it. And then, all of a sudden, I felt something come over me. And I felt a little lighter. I got up off the floor. And I came out and saw you walking across the parking lot. And I said, is it a vision? <laughs> I said, and then he said, sister, do you think God really knows I'm alive and that he cares? I said, well, are you kidding? He certainly knows you're alive, and he has a plan for your life. I think he really does care about you because the only magazine I had left in the car is this one. It's all about hope. And I handed it to him, and the man and I chatted a little longer, and he saw that God not only cared about him, but I knew that Father McGivney cared about him, too. And he cares about you. But just don't take my word for it. If you become a member of the Father McGivney Guild, and, and I'm not getting paid for it promoting any of this, <laughs> but it is stunning to read every month all the favors, the miracles that come in 
through, reported through intercession of Father McGivney. And the favor suggests that Father, from his place in eternity, is concerned about many of the problems you are concerned about and that he dealt with as a priest on earth and really that every priest hears day every day. Employment, finances, substance abuse, health, family reconciliation, return to the faith. But he is ready to help in any situation. And I'll just read you a few examples. Are you unemployed? He finds jobs. Do you have financial problems? He'll sell your house. One guy said, I had my house on the market for five months with no offers. I started praying to Father McGivney and in two weeks my house was sold. One man with heart trouble. I had died on the table, they said, and I came back because my family members were praying to Father McGivney and today I'm a grand knight. Here's a story from Tennessee. I'm a vet, 73 years old, with PTSD. I need a double knee replacement, and they said, if you don't lose 140 pounds, you're gonna end up in a wheelchair. I tried for three years, started praying to Father McGivney, and I lost 50 pounds, and now I'm only using a cane, and I know it'll be a miracle. One woman was having hearing trouble. Uh, they said her deafness, was permanent, but she didn't give up. She prayed one night to Father McGivney to heal her, went to bed, woke up the next day, and heard a dog barking. He healed her in one night. These are just a few miracles. But Father McGivney started because primarily he knew how essential men are to the family as husbands and fathers and it was the concerns of the family that led him to found the Knights. He began by seeing a good friend, Edward Downs, who died and left a widow and many children. And in those days, unless they could be supported, they were divided between relatives or friends and the older ones were left to fend for themselves because there would be a widow who was destitute. And so the Knights pulled together and supported those widows, and so he could keep families together. Time and again, we have seen what a difference a man can make. He sees the need, just like Father McGivney did, and he does something about it. In our missions, we see this very often, and I'll tell you a few stories. One of the women, and this is just, um, I think where Father McGivney shines in Catholic manhood. But the influence men, I can't impress upon you enough how important you are and how important it is for you to be present to women and children even today. It makes all the difference in the world. And uh, if you leave here today with one, just one thing, just say that you are needed. We all need you. I, no woman can do what you, only you can do as a man. A few years ago, one of the single mothers who lived with us at our convent in Manhattan, her name is Faye, gave birth to a child, and the child had uh, serious medical problems and ended up in intensive care. She herself ended up needing surgery, and so back and forth to Brooklyn we went to the hospital, if you know New York City, and we're on the west side of Manhattan, and she's in Brooklyn, even though you're in New York City, you're looking at a two-hour commute at times. So nights, days, and hours upon hours with Faye. One day she was released from the hospital in a very um, compromised position with a newborn, and looked high and low for a car. We couldn't find anybody to pick her up. Finally, someone remembered Barry, who owned a car service. We called Barry, and instantly he said, there is no way that that young mother is getting on a train in her condition. He sent a car, 
and he said, if she doesn't arrive home in royal style, I want to know. So I think he gave him a good tip. The car dropped her off at the front door, and Faye walked in 10 feet tall. You know, I mean, we could bend over backwards for years, and she would say thank you. But she talked about Barry, a man she never met for months, because he saw a need, and he did something about it. At another time in the same convent in Manhattan, we were enduring the first really hot day. And it was, uh, we need to get the air conditioners in these newborns, these mothers are in trouble, they're not sleeping. And the phone rang and it was Charles. And he said, it's really hot out today. Do the air conditioners need to be put in? We said, please, come on over. Half hour later, he was there and 15 minutes in each mom's room and the air conditioners were in. And then Charles waved, call me if you need anything, and left. One of the moms came out and said, Sister, can I talk to you? Who was that? Oh, that's Charles. He's just one of the volunteers. Not just, but he's one of our volunteers. And she said, he's a prince. I think he just restored my faith in men. He looked at me. He smiled. He said, how are you? And he loved my baby and said how cute my baby was. And that was it. It doesn't take much. At our retreat center in Stamford, Villa Maria, uh, we offer weekend retreats. And one retreat a year is for men only, the working men's retreat. And it's one of our favorites, actually. On Saturday of this weekend, all the men got on a bus with the sisters. And on Saturday of this weekend, it's a working men's retreat. So we men get on a bus and they go to the mother house to spend a day of working. And the uh, director is always one of the CFR priests, Father Lewis. On this particular day, the then superior of the house, Sister Mary Karen, just announced to the men that it was the 40 Days for Life campaign and that they would be stopping at Dr. Emily's on the way to the mother house to do a public witness for the 40 days for life. And you might imagine that the men had very different reactions, not sure they wanted to do this. This wasn't part of the original plan. Uh, not sure if they wanted to be seen or associated with protesters, etc. But you just can't say no to Sister Mary Karen or to Father Lewis for that matter. So off they went. And when they arrived and all 50 men got off the bus, Father said, okay, we're gonna pray a rosary, men, here, and then we'll head to the mother house. The men prayed. And as they prayed, they saw women entering into the facility. Some, they saw people trying to dissuade them and they saw a nondescript building that these women, some very young, were sucked into, most with their heads covered, alone, or often with another girlfriend. All of a sudden, she had a face. It was their sister, it was their daughter, it was their baby, it was their friend, a former girlfriend. They may never had been face to face, with what abortion was until that moment. At the end of the rosary, Father Lewis said, okay, men, on your knees for one minute in reverent silence for all the lives that have been lost here today and for the conversion of those who work here and for the healing of all the women and men who suffered here today. On their knees, the men later said, for me, it was a minute of conviction, for another, a minute of deep conversion. I'm not doing enough, said one. Another said, I feel so helpless, 
I want to scream, don't do it. Another remorse. Why didn't I support her? And for another, grief and tears. All were moved. Back on the bus, the men approached Sister Mary Karen. Tell me what you need and I'll do it. I need to do more. What can I do? Some went to confession. Why? The experience touched their father's heart and either convicted them of times they may have failed in fatherhood or it opened a hurting place in their father's heart, something me and my sisters see all the time. Some spurned them on to want to be better fathers, better people, and they received the grace that day to make the decision to engage this battle. They could not stand idle and do nothing or live as though it wasn't a concern of theirs. God used this experience to challenge their father's heart. And the battle is raging today against marriage and the family and the unborn. And where the battle rages, men, that is where the heroes are. They see a need and they do something about it. In conclusion, Father McGivney was an ordinary man from Waterbury. Not unlike every one of, of us in this stadium, never flashy, straightforward, down to earth, soon to be a saint. But when he saw a need, he did something about it. And when he was chosen by God to change the course of the American church, and it was good men who responded, and that is the reason it was so. Each one of you men here in this stadium has been chosen by God for a specific purpose. Perhaps he has placed needs in front of you, small or great, and that he wants you to do something about it. But the most important thing that Father McGivney would want from you is that you would recognize how important your contribution is simply as you are, as a faithful, prayerful Catholic man to your family, your neighbor, your city, your town, to Connecticut, to the church, to the world. Thank you, men, and God bless you. Thank you, sister. All right, let's see. We've got, uh, we're going to be taking our lunch break. So confessions are available. This is the time for confession. Obviously recommended for everybody.